The date is February 23rd, 1997. The survivor is Dr. Ludwig Klein. The interviewer is Heidi Bratt. City is New York City. State is New York. Country is USA. The language is English. I'm Heidi Bratt, and I have the privilege of interviewing Dr. Ludwig Klein. The date is February 23rd, 1997. The interview is being conducted in New York, New York. The country is USA. The language is English. What is your full name? Ludwig Klein. Could you spell that for us? L-U-D-W-I-G-K-L-E-I-N. And Dr. Klein, what was your name at birth? It was the same, except it was spelled with a K at the end, L-U-D-W-I-K, which is the Polish spelling. Did you have any other names? I had some other names during the war, um, uh, aliases, and uh, you might go in, get into that a little later on. Any nicknames? Uh, no, Lud, most people call me Lud. Um, my parents used to call me Luddy. Um, what is your birth date? January 17, 1933. And how old are you today? 64. What city were you born in? I was born in Lwów, L-W-O-W, -W, or otherwise known as Lemberg, L-E-M-B-E-R-G, and at that time it was Poland. Was that a big city? That was a big city. That was the, um, I believe it was the capital of Galicia at the time. And did you grow up there? No, I was just born there. Um, I lived in a smaller town about uh, um, 60 miles or 100 kilometers uh, um, south, more or less, of uh, Wolf, which was a town called Skole. S K O L E. That was a small town? That was a small town of about uh, 10,000 people. What was your mother's name? My mother's name was Nika, shortened from Monica Rice, R E I S S. And your father's name? My father's name, um, he was born Israel Klein. And he later changed it to Paul Emanuel Klein when he came to this country. Did you have any brothers or sisters? No. I'm an only child. Can you describe what it was like growing up in Skole? Well, it was, uh, we lived on Main Street. Um, Do you remember the name of the street? Uh, I think it was uh, uh, called Ulica Pilsudska. Uh, after the, uh, the Polish president. Um, and that was the main street in town. We lived in a big house, and uh, my father, who was a physician, had his office in the home. So the ho it was both a home, and part of it was a home, and the other part was an office. Um, uh, we had a very large uh, backyard, and um, and I think we have a picture of me in that backyard uh, where we would, uh, I mean, you could grow vegetables or um, um, grass, we would mow the grass uh, and uh, um, make it into hay, actually, um, and uh, feed the cows who were across the street. Uh, and my grandfather and grandmother used to live across the street, and, and uh, that hay would feed my grandfather's cow. What, so what were your grandparents' names? Well, the, my grandfather who lived across the street, his uh, name was Samuel, Samuel Klein. And my grandmother's name was uh, Miriam, or Mary as she was called. Um, uh, Maria, actually, Maria um, Klein. And they had a farm? They had a well, they had a, a small farm. Uh, um, they had um, one or two cows and chickens, and uh, uh, and 
that, that my grandfather tended, and uh, don't forget that I remember him when he was in his 70s uh, and 80s. So before that, he, they had a, um, a sort of a, um, um, you know, all-around store, but that was before my time. I don't remember that. And, uh, um, um, but but when I remember him, he was be he was he was retired and puttering around the house and making toys for me and milking his cow and uh, repairing the house and. Uh, taking care of some of the real estate that he owned nearby. Um, you spent a lot of time at your grandparents' house? Yes, I did. I did. It was always, uh, the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence, so that was always exciting to go visit Grandma and Grandpa, who, as I said, just lived literally across the street, uh, which was the way I think a family should be raised. Um, so when I needed some excitement, I would go over there and, um, um, you know, my grandmother would dote on me and make me my special foods and drinks. And um, they, we both had um, had apple trees, but their apple trees were always uh, their apples were always better than my apple tree apples. So I would go over there and get uh, eat their apples. So you would pick their apples. Exactly, exactly, right, right. Well, they would come in at different times in the season. So I think their apples would come in a little bit earlier than ours. So uh, that was always a, a treat to go over there and climb that tree and uh, or shake the tree usually and, and get some apples from over there. And also my uh, my aunt and uncle lived there and a well actually two aunts and uncles lived over there and it was a kind of a compound. And there were several houses in that compound. My grandfather and grandmother lived in one house. My aunt and uncle and their son, who was about three years younger than I was, his name was Edward, I mentioned that in that uh, write-up, um, he lived there. And also another aunt and uncle lived also in that compound. And they had a daughter, um, Irma. So it was always exciting to go over there to be with the kids and with other members of the family, besides the apple trees. So what did you do when you were there with your... your well, don't forget, I was, you know, the memories I have were when I was four or five or six. Uh, the war broke out when I was six, so you, you either, you know, sampled grandma's food or you went to the barn and watched grandpa milk the cow and he would let me milk the cow and Occasionally, he would let me drink the fresh milk coming from the cow. Uh, that was not my favorite. That that milk I can still taste. It was not uh, didn't particularly care for it. But some people like it. And he would make toys for me, and he would um, you know let me um, mow the grass with a scythe. You know. Um, um, would play with the uh, with my cousins Edward and Irma um, she would always cry when I got punished I wouldn't cry but she would when I got smacked why were you getting punished well I know you know boys get into trouble now and then especially when they're five years old and, you know, so um, that I remember that she would always I couldn't quite figure out why she cried when I didn't cry What about in your own home? Did, did anybody else live in the house with your family? We had a full-time maid, and uh, we had a, a governess. Do you remember their names? Well, the full-time maid's name was Nasha. Uh, the governess' name, I, I do not recall. Uh, I know I had more than one. I certainly recall two. Uh, one pleasantly and the other one not so pleasantly, but I don't remember their names. Can you tell us a little bit about your father? He was a doctor. What sort of medicine did he practice? What he was a doctor. He was a family physician in town. 
Um, he had a dual practice. One, he had a private practice, fee for service, and the other uh, part of his practice was that he was the uh, chief medical officer for the workman's compensation system in the area. Um, and there were only two Jews in Poland who were allowed to advance to that position, and he was one of them. Um, and uh, as I say, the, the, his office was in the home, and uh, very often, I, in th those days, doctors made house calls, and um, very often I would accompany him t to house calls, and that was a big treat for me. And those house calls were made in uh, one of two ways. Um, he had a car and a driver at his disposal. And it was a, a Citroen, if you want to name the make of the car, um, French car. Uh, and so I would ride along in the car when, while he made a house call, and I would wait with the driver outside, uh, because um, you know, many of those house calls were due to uh, people being sick with contagious diseases, so he tried to keep me away from those people, and I wouldn't, I would be very disappointed when he s suspected it was rather contagious, so he wouldn't take me along. And then in the winter time, you know, the road, this was a very hilly area, and a very mountainous area, um, you, uh, the car just wouldn't make it, wouldn't make it on the road, so you took a sleigh and a horse, ho usually two horses and a sleigh. And you bundle yourself up, you know, with uh, lots of blankets, and you off you went. And that was another treat. Uh, I would go with my father to on a house call. Didn't happen too often, but once in a while, that was a, in the winter time. That was a big treat. So, um, what about your mother? What can you describe? What she did and your early memories of. Well, she was uh, she was a homemaker. Uh, um, um, she read to me. Um, um, she was the one who was home when my father was working. Um, besides the, the governess and the maid. Uh, um, For um, uh, my grandparents on my on my mother's side lived in Lemberg, which is why, where I was born. So usually on holidays, especially Passover, we would go to Lemberg with my mother. Uh, my father would stay in Skoda working, uh, but my mother and I would go for Passover Seder um, and a little vacation to my grandparents in Lemberg, and uh, I would spend some time there. And my mother has a younger brother uh, whose pictures we'll see. Um, and he and I would sort of, uh, you know, be cavort and be friends, and I would look up to him. Um, uh, so that's where I would meet, meet them and my mother up in my grandparents' house. What were um, the names of your mother's parents? My mother's parents, my grandfather was Shulim Rice, and my grandmother was uh, Bertha Rice. And your uncle? My uncle, their son, is Edmund Rice. And he lives in Vienna, Austria at the present time. What about school? Can you mm -hmm. um, tell mm -hmm. us what right. kind of school did you go to? Well, um, when the war broke out, I was just about to start school. I was six years old when the war broke out in 1939. And um, at that time, I went to the public school, first grade, as I recall. And uh, because the the Russians were in Poland at the time. This was right after the, the, the 1939, September 39, when the war broke out. That part of Poland that I was in was occupied by the Russians. Um, 
the other part of Poland was occupied by the Germans, so the, well, Poland was divided into two. Excuse me. And so the, the language of instruction was not Polish, it was Ukrainian. So that my first alphabet was, Ukraine, was the Cyrillic alphabet, and the Ukrainians used the Cyrillic alphabet. Uh, so I remember that as the um, thing from my first grade. This was a public school? This was a public school, as I recall, yes. Were there um, other Jewish children oh, yes. in the school? Yes, yes. There were Jewish and non-Jewish children in the school at the time. Did Skole have a lot of Jews living yes, there? Yes, yes. They had quite a number of Jews. I can't tell you the percentage, but mm, maybe 15, 20 percent. I'm just off the top of my head. Um, yes. Yes, there, were, uh, there was a, at least one synagogue and maybe more. I'm not sure. What about religious life in the home? Well, my, both my grandparents were very observant. Uh, my grandfather, both my grandparents, uh, put on the talus every morning. Uh, they both wore yarmulkes all the time. Um, neither, even though they smoked, uh, come Shabbos, they, they did not smoke. Uh, and of course, observed all the holidays and prayed every every morning and every evening. Um, we were less observant. My father did not wear a yarmulke, and uh, we went to sh to synagogue less often. Um, what about Shabbos? Uh, Shabbos, my mother lit the candles every Shabbos. We had a kosher home before the war. Um, we had the usual, you know, uh, two sir, two sets of china. To, uh, actually, three sets: one for 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 milchik, one for uh, uh, meat, and the other one for Passover china. China that was separate. So there were three sets. Um, and my, my grandmother, who lived across the street, my grandfather, they had two kitchens, two ovens, two separate kitchens, one for the everyday kitchen and the other kitchen where you cooked for, for Passover. And that other kitchen was only used for Passover. So that was, the, that was the custom. Can you share with us a memory of one of the holidays at, at home or at your grandmother's? Well, the, 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 the Seder was always uh, uh, stands out, as you can imagine, in, uh, in a child's mind. And uh, the, the Seder and my, my grandfather, Sh Shulam, and grandmother Bertha Rice's home in Lemberg stands out because that's when I was, uh, I was the youngest and I would ask the, the questions. Um, so that stood out, and they always opened the door for Elijah to come in, and they fill the cup for Elijah. That I remember when I was, I must have been four or five, five or so. Um, but that was traditional. I, that was probably traditional even before, you know, when I was one or two. But that, those I don't, obviously don't remember. I, but I remember perhaps one or, or two satyrs. Uh, so that must have been when I was about uh, four and five. I think when I was six, the boar had already broken. Um, uh, was already on, so I don't think we had a Seder in Lemberg. Uh, or maybe maybe we did, maybe we did. The Seder, the war broke out in September, and the Seder, of course, is in the spring, so I maybe, I know, it must have been six, well, that was my last Seder, with my grandparents in Lemberg. Did you have a lot of other family there? Uh, n yes, my, uh, my, Uncle had a cousin who's, uh, um, who, um, um, Jacob, uh, who did manage to survive the war. He went to Israel and he, he was in the Israeli military and he was killed in an accident. So I remember him. Um, those are the only memories of, of relatives in, in Lemberg. My, my grandparents, 
my uncle, who's thank God is still alive today, and um, and Jacob, Jacob Rice, his cousin. So that would be a distant relative of mine. Um, Did you have any friends as a little boy? Uh, a few, a few, um, not not very close friends, no. Were they from school? Or they were mostly from school, yes, yes. Do you remember any of them? Or um, I remember one, um, Mr. Wilf, uh, and he survived the war, and he came to the United States. What, what uh, was his name? Wilf. Uh, it's a probably originally Wolf, but it was called now it's Bilf. Um, forget what his first name was, and he was actually a classmate of mine. We went to that elementary school that I spoke of before, and as I say, he survived the war, came to this country, and then I think then he emigrated to Israel. I've lost contact with him since he left the United States. Um, as far as I know, he's the only one I know of who. Of the Jews who, who from that, who was a classmate and survived the war. Um, uh, I, well, don't forget, I was six years old. So he's the only person I remember, and I probably remember him because I, I reconnected with him after the war, here. So. Um, Do you? Do you remember what you liked to do as a little boy? What did you do? Any sports or play or? Well, soccer was the was the game. Uh, um, um, you know, in a small town, you you don't get into too much mischief because the, everybody knows you, so you have to be on your guard and to, um, and. Um, um, uh, not too many concrete memories of that uh, that era. Back in your um, your grandparents' house, any anything else you remember? Any some of your most pleasant childhood memories? What what do you remember that was a particularly nice? Well, time? well, being doted on by my grandmother. Um, my you grandfather. Remember what she cooked for you? Well, I don't remember what she cooked for me, but she made uh, she made her own uh, uh, strawberry uh, juice, concentrated, very sweet strawberry juice, and you took either uh, some water or c uh, seltzer, and you mixed the two, and that was a very refreshing drink. I still remember this to this very day because I would, you know all sweated up and tired and running around across the street and playing and she would always have that I would she would call it red water so I would have the red water and that was uh, that's a memory that still remains my grandmother's uh, Miriam you know, Maria Klein's uh, red water um, so that was very refreshing and then my grandfather making toys for me so that was. Uh, what what kind of toys did he make? Well, he would make the usual, uh, you know, the um, clown on on that on two st st uh, strings that were uh, crisscrossed, and then when you when you squeezed, you straightened out the crisscross, and the tr crown t clown would would jump up and down. And so he would just. Uh, so that was that was. He he showed me that, and he made that for me. So that was fun. And as I say, you know, milking the cow and taking care of the cow and feeding the cow, he would show me how to, you know, cut up the potatoes uh, for to feed the cow and how to put hay for the cow and so forth. Um, so that was that was kind of fun you know, to see how that that ran. Um, And at home, it was a little more serious. Uh, it was more serious, formal. More it was more formal. formal, more serious. That's correct. You're right. You're absolutely right. Uh, you had to mind your P's and Q's at home. 
was uh, with grandmother and grandfather, well, you know, you could let loose a little bit. You, you could. Uh, were your parents strict with you? Well, I think they were the usual, you know, middle class um, parents. Uh, fairly, yeah, yes, I would say they were fairly strict. Yes, but you know, I, I don't have anything to compare them to. And in, uh, in those days, I think most middle class Jewish parents were. That's the kind of upbringing you had. Um, rules were set, set, and you were expected to, to, um, you know, abide by them. Your mother had some higher education. Yes, she she uh, finished the matura, and then she had two years of university training. What is matura is? Matura, it's still to, it's, it's still to this day. It's when you finish gymnasium, you uh, you, you pass an exam, and you, and it's called matura, um, presumably because you're mature now and. Um, um, it's it's about equivalent to one or, or two years of college. Um, it's very formal. I mean, there are specific courses to take. There's there's very little elective, if any, and that's true to this very day. The, the system is such it's true to this day on on most of the continent. Continent. Um, um. Do you know how to not your parents? They were basically uh, they were. Um, fixed up. Um, my, um, let's see, my, my uh, mother's aunt mm -hmm. knew someone in town where we lived who knew of my father. And they got together and they said, hey, you know, I know about this girl and, you know, I know about this man and um, how about getting them together? And they arranged uh, a date of my parents, uh, my mother and father. And I think the first date was in Lemberg. My father went up to Lemberg and, uh, well, that's, the rest is history. But it wasn't, it was not a, a an arranged marriage. It was just somebody fixing somebody up, which is what happens here in this, uh, to this very day, as you, as you know. Um, I mean, it, was, it was basically a blind, I suppose you could call it a blind date, basically. So, um, Anything else you that I remember about my parents meeting? That's all I know. That's the only lore that I I can remember. That's uh, um, because my my daughter Elizabeth asked my mother that just recently how they met, and then she was under the impression that it was an arranged marriage. No, it was not an arranged marriage. Arranged marriages were not uncommon in those days, but this was not an arranged marriage. Just somebody fixing them up. And Meeting them for that sort of thing. The interview with Dr. Ludwig Klein today is February 23rd, 1997. Um, Dr. Klein, um, do you remember uh, when the war broke out, what happened, where you were, what, how things started to change when the war broke out in 1939? Right. Well, when the war broke out in September, I think it was September 1st, 1939, um, uh, Germany and or in Russia had a, an, a prior agreement where when Germany attacked Poland, uh, Russia would attack Poland from the other side. And then they would divide Poland into a, Polish, into a Russian zone and a German zone. And we wound up in the I just happened to be in the Russian zone. So, um, how did life change for you? Um, 
Well, uh, I remember it took about six weeks to defeat Poland, and I remember we were listening. There was no television, of course, at the time. Uh, we were just listening to the radio, and there were all sorts of. I remember as a child listening to the radio, and there were all these secret messages, secret code coming across over the radio, over the actual radio stations. They were, I think, the military must have preempted the radio station because they didn't have any other. Maybe they didn't have any other forms of communication, or they didn't have enough forms of communication. So I remember when you listen to usual radio, you would hear the music or something like that. But during the, as soon as the war started, the first or second day of the war, you heard codes. I mean, people speaking in Polish, but it made no sense to, to me. It was um, essentially uh, um, you know, gibberish. But that presumably meant something to the people who were supposed to decipher these codes. And I remember that vividly as quite, um, you know, something quite unusual. Suddenly, on, on just about every radio station that you could tune in on, there was this, this, these code words <laughs> were coming across, and nothing else <laughs> was happening. So, I mean, occasionally there would be news and so forth, but, but uh, this was quite unusual. So I remember that um, I was six years old at the time. Well, um, what did your parents tell you? Well, I don't remember that they told me anything specific, but it was very obvious in listening to my parents talk and my grandparents talk and to their relatives and their friends and and on the telephone and so forth that the war had broken out. Uh, what war means to a six-year-old child is, uh, you know, it doesn't mean very much to a six-year-old child because you don't understand the consequences of war, and you have no historical knowledge of war. So it doesn't mean too much. Um, as I say, the, interest, the, the things that I remember, for instance, was, was this radio, these radio messages, which didn't make any sense, and that, I thought that was very unusual. Um, uh, that's number one. And then, uh, then I remember the, there was a question of what to do. Should we, should we flee? And if so, where? Should we run away someplace? Uh, and you know the options were rather limited at the time because uh, you know there was one side was Germany and the other one side was was Russia and you know there weren't too many places you could you could run to. And <coughs> we were uh, close to the border of, with Hungary, and at that time Hungary was neutral. So there was an option of fleeing to Hungary. And I remember um, uh, there was my father's friends uh, had a car, and they were traveling to Hungary. They made a decision to flee to Hungary. So, and they stopped off on their way to Hungary in Skole, and they spent a day or two in our house, and their car was parked in our, in our driveway. And my father and mother were trying to make up their mind because they had room in their car. If we wanted to, they said, "Come with us to Hungary." What year was this? This was 1930. This was 1939. And um, um, and they even waited for us. I think for 24 hours or so for my father, and for my parents to make up their mind whether to flee with with them to Hungary or to stay put. Well, as you can imagine, there was a lot of back and forth, should we or shouldn't we. There was discussion with my, with my, my grandparents, uh, with some of my father's uh, brothers and sisters, and sister-in-laws and brother-in-laws, and so forth, and as to what to do. And finally, the decision was made. Uh, my father did not want to leave his parents alone and his family, so we stayed put. And uh, the friends continued on to Hungary in their car. Um, so that was, uh, that was in 1939, right shortly after the war broke out. And um, shortly thereafter, uh, the Russians came. And they came around, and uh, they occupied the, that the area where where we lived, and uh, they, uh, some of the Russian soldiers were housed on the second floor of our of our um, house. 
So we now lived on the first floor. My father has his office on the first floor. And the second floor we had to vacate for to quarter the Russian soldiers. Your father was still able to practice medicine? Oh, yes, yes. During the Russian occupation, my father practiced medicine. There's no problem. Right. But, you know, we were somewhat constrained because the Russian soldiers were now living on the second floor. Uh, they were making a lot of noise. Uh, well, you know, like the soldiers do, you know. And uh, they were, you know, throwing around. They had a bowling ball that they were playing around with, so you can imagine living, um, uh, you know, on the first floor with somebody playing with a bowling ball on the second floor. But, you know, that wasn't the worst of it. <laughs> but I remember that. Because they finally managed to make a hole in the, in the, roof, in the ceiling by throwing that, that, uh, that bowling ball around. Uh, but nevertheless, they, um, uh, we also had a barn, and they managed to, dis to just take that apart and use the, use the wood uh, from the barn to light fires with. So that barn was, was uh, taken apart. Nevertheless, uh, they, the Russians in general like children very much. They dote on children. And I was six years old, seven years old, and they doted on me. I mean, they, you know, they played with me. They, you know what you do with a seven-year-old boy, you know? You, you play with him, you, you give him military hats to wear, you give him military insignia to wear. And so, you know, that was kind of fun. Uh, um, so, and I learned a little bit of Russian from the, from the soldiers. So, and as I said before, I was going to school uh, uh, at the time, and I think it was about, I think one, about a year, no more than that. Um, maybe, maybe a year and a half, I'm not sure. Because remember, the, the Russians were there from 1939 to 1941. Uh, in 1941, the Germans came. They kicked, the Germans kicked the Russians out. And so that now Germany controlled all of Poland instead of just half of Poland. Um, so what what <coughs> what happened then? What changes happened when the Nazis came in? Well, well, let me just just go back to the Russian because it's interesting from a historical point of view. Um, when the Russians came, uh, my grandparents who lived in Lemberg, who were rather well-to-do, the Russians considered them, um, uh, what's the word? I'm trying to think of the word that they use. Um, um, uh, too rich, too rich. And if you were too rich, then you were exiled by law. So the Russians exiled my grandparents from Lemberg. Uh, and uh, they, of course, confiscated all their property, real estate. My grandfather had a store, a large store. Uh, that was buildings that they owned. That was all confiscated. And, and they put, put them the, in, into what's called internal exile. Internal exile meant that you had to live at least 100 kilometers from where you were. In other words, he lived in Lemberg, and he had to live 100 kilometers away, anywhere within at least 100 kilometers or more uh, radius from the town of Lemberg. Well, um, oh, I'm sorry, the, the word I was use, uh, looking for before was bourgeois. He was a bourgeois. So anybody with a little bit of money and, or a store or some real estate was called bourgeois and his property and that, that, that was sort of like, uh, you know, bad guys by definition if you had a little money. So their property was confiscated and he was kicked out into internal exile. My, then my grandparents, since they were kicked out of Lemberg, they came to live with us in our house. So now we had the Russians upstairs, 
my, um, my parents and I downstairs, and my grandparents downstairs. My, okay? So that consisted of my grandfather, my grandmother, and my uncle, Eddie. Um, so we lived downstairs. And um, uh, my grandfather Rice taught me how to make, he would make his own sauerkraut and his own pickled pickles, pickled pickles, um, sour pickles. And he, that was his specialty, so to speak. And he also taught me how to play chess. Since you asked for some memories, uh, I remember that. So he, he played chess with me. He taught me how to play chess. Um, you know, time was heavy on his hands. Suddenly he was kicked out, no job, uh, nothing to do. So, so he, uh, we lived as a family together now. Um, so they were there? They were there from 1939 till, for two years, more or less, till 1941 when Germany invaded the Russian part of Poland. And what happened then? Well, then things started to go from bad to worse. Um, all the, the German Jewish laws came into effect. Um, the, the Germans would stage what they call a razzia, R-A-Z-Z-I-A. It was a raid, on meaning it was a, a hunt for Jews. And uh, a train would arrive at the station. Uh, the police would come into the, to the town, the German police, and I think some of the local police as well. And they, their job was to find so many Jews to fill that train. So they would try and catch Jews on the street. They would go into their homes to, to corral them and pack them into the train. And um, uh, we, we knew this was going on because how we... Did you, how did you know? Well, uh, first of all, we, we had a relative who worked in a train station where these trains were coming from. And he had advanced, he or she, I forget who it was, had advanced knowledge of the schedule of the trains. So he was able to warn us. Uh, I remember when once or twice my father got a letter. Uh, now remember, the letters were censored in those days. They were officially censored. The letter was opened by the censor and read and then closed again and, and sent on. But I'm sure some of them were not sent on. but. So you had to uh, write in um, sort of uh, uh, in, in code, so to speak. You, can't, you couldn't say, you know, there's going to be a train at, on the 25th of February. Uh, we'll be arriving to pick up 100 Jews. I mean, they, you couldn't say that. You could say that, that uh, mother, that, that grandma, um, um, Sarah, is going to be very sick on the 25th of February. And she might get better within a day or so. Okay, there was no Grandma Sarah, so you kind of knew that that was the clue that on the 25th you better lay low, you better hide, because that's what's going to happen. So um, uh, my grandparents across the street built a hiding place. Uh, remember in those days, and still to this day in Europe, uh, people had cellars. Um, which are, you know, they're not like basements because basements, you know, are partly up and partly down, but cellars are really underground, and you would use them as they're very good storage spaces, and they, they're pretty much constant temperature throughout the the year, a little warmer in the summer, a little colder in the winter, but pretty cool. So you would use that as an extra storage space, and you could play there and so forth. So my grandfather, who was a builder, uh, um, Sam Klein, he 
closed off part of the cellar, camouflaged the part of the cellar, so in other words, made a cellar smaller than it was. In his house. In his house, right. And uh, managed to make a little, a little entrance against camouflage and store some food there and water so that when this raid came, he and, his, and the family would go there and hide until the raid was over. Do you, did you go in there? We had another hiding place in our house. My father built another hiding place in the attic of our house. And uh, again, camouflaged and so forth. And we could even see from that attic because we could make a, we made a little hole, removed one shingle a little slightly so we could see the street. And we could see what was going on in the street. And we could hear uh, the police coming into the house and looking around and saying, gee, you know, where do they go? Where are they? You know. And the same thing happened with my grandparents across the street. Do you remember being in that attic? Oh, yes. How many times? I remember being in that attic at least twice. And who was in there with you? My mother, my father, my grandfather Shulim Rice and my grandmother Shulim Rice who came from Lemberg to live with us and continue to live with us. And I think my uncle Eddie was there, well, may have been there once because he worked uh, and he may have hidden himself at work at, the, at one time. So I'm not sure whether he was there one time or more than once or not at all. Because he managed to, um, well, his story is a little different. Because at, I know at one time during these raids, he was working, and so was my grandfather working, in a, in a lumber mill out of town, outside of town. The lumber mill was called Demnia, and I mentioned that I mentioned the word Demnia because ultimately that that area Demnia, uh, where the uh, lumber mill was located, became a labor camp for Jews. But at the beginning, 1941, early 42, my uncle and my grandfather both worked in that lumber mill. So it was possible that at one time that my uncle and my grandfather were not in that hiding place. I don't recall. How long would you have to stay in the hiding place? Usually two or three days and until the raid was over. What so were you thinking when you were in there? Well, uh, you know, uh, when you're six years old and seven, well, seven years old, eight years old, you don't have a concept of death for yourself. You, you don't, that doesn't, at least not in my mind, that dying was not, as I recall, was not a, a, a possibility, a real possibility. It was, uh, my parents, of course, yes, but for me, that was kind of, um, you know, I was frightened, quite frightened. Uh, uh, I could hear the screams of the people being caught on the street, and my father could see, although I didn't quite want to see or I wasn't allowed to see, I forget exactly what. I don't have a memory of seeing that. I have a memory of, of looking onto the street, but I didn't see anything happening. When they were looking, there were things were happening and they saw their friends or uh, being caught and, and pushed into being arrested and just taken to the train station. Um, but as a child, you do not have a realistic concept of, of death. So it was frightening, very frightening. Um, sort of focused on the immediate thing. The immediate thing was to keep your mouth shut and not to, not to make any noise because the police was in the, in the house and you could, I could hear their voices. You know, they were looking around saying, where, where are they? Where could they have gone? I, you know, we can't find them. They went to the basement and, and they, couldn't, they couldn't find us. So, and as I say, that 
attic was well camouflaged. It was a big house, and it was one of those big Victorian houses with little lots of nooks and crannies. So when you came into a house, you couldn't quite get oriented. You know, you could there could be hiding places, and you didn't think it was uh, there was one. Um, so um, I remember my father fashioned a ladder, a ladder that you could climb up the ladder, and then you pulled the ladder behind you. Uh, and then you hid the ladder up in the attic, and then you, we had a, you know, it was camouflage there. And then when the raid was over two or three days later, it was safe to go out again, and you went downstairs again, put the ladder down, and you went downstairs again. And uh, I know my grandparents across the street, grandparents Klein and, and their family, uh, these two s sons, the two, two the son and the daughter-in-law and a daughter and a son-in-law and their children survived in the hiding place in the cellar in my grandfather Klein's house, so survived similar raids. And we survived across the street, the, the raids. Um, and what happened? Well, uh, then, um, sometime later, sometime perhaps in 40, I think 1942, uh, the law came in saying that uh, scholar had to be Judenfrei, or Judenfrei. Judenfrei means that no Jews were allowed to live in the town. So you had a choice of either going to, I think you had a choice of either going to a ghetto. And the ghetto, I think you, there was a ghetto in Stray. Stray was a, was a S-T-R-Y-J was the town uh, where mm, we had a relative who lived there. I think my father's, uh, my father's sister lived in Stray. And they had a ghetto. I think the choice was you can go to the ghetto in Stray and move there. Possibly the ghetto in Lemberg, I'm not sure. Or you could go to the labor camp in Demya, which was uh, maybe, I don't know, seven, eight miles, five, five seven miles outside of, this, of Skala. And uh, we decided to, my father, and uh, my mother and my grandparents on my mother's side decided to go to the to Demya, the, the labor camp. My grandfather on my father's side, the one who lived across the street, and his daughter, son-in-law, their child, who was Edward, who was about three years younger than I was, um, and his, his other son, um, Edward, um, Edmund, I'm sorry, his other son was named Marcus. Marcus, his, his nickname was Munjo, but Marcus was his first name. He des they decided to go into hiding with a U Ukrainian peasant family, about, I'm guessing now, about 20 miles away from Skoda. Uh, and that peasant family was supposed to hide, hide them, and they would pay the money, of course, periodically, and they would hide them in their farmhouse um, and feed them, basically, until the war was over. That was the agreement. Uh, well, it didn't turn out that way. Uh, in 19, around 1942 or early 43, um, rumors started to surface from several uh, quarters that there was a lot of jewelry gold jewelry and some gold coins uh, floating around that little uh, um, town that my grandparents were hiding. And uh, all communications from them ceased. So we uh, surmised that they were killed for the money. 
They were murdered by the Ukrainian peasants. Um, so there were my, my grandfather, um, Sam Klein, my grandmother, uh, Miriam Klein, my cousin Edward, who must have been about five, six year, five years old, six years old at the time. Um, his mother, Sophie, his father, I don't recall his name, so five, um, and my, my uncle, my father's brother, Marcus, or Munjo, as he was called. So there were six people who were killed, uh, murdered by the uh, Ukrainian peasants. It wasn't by the Germans. Did you know the name of the people they stayed with? Uh, no, no. How did you learn about this? Well, as I say, you learned about that because, you know, don't forget, this is a, a little uh, a village, a Ukrainian village. Uh, you don't have too much uh, um, expensive jewelry around there or gold coins. I mean, that just doesn't exist. And if suddenly that starts floating around, I mean, where did that come from all of a sudden? And suddenly, we had some sort of communication with, with them, and that ceased. So you know, you know exactly what happened. And these things happened quite a bit, so this was, was not unusual. It wasn't unexpected. So that's what happened to my grandparents across the street on my father's side and his family. Uh, and that was around, uh, around 42, 43, early 43, late 42, something like that. Um, and as I say, my father and my mother and her parents decided to go to this labor camp in Demna. In the meantime, my uncle, who was, um, I think, about 18 at the time, and some other young people decided to uh, not to go to the labor camp, not to go to the ghetto, but they decided to arm themselves with whatever little they had. I don't think they had two guns or something like that. They managed to get before or during, and uh, decided to live in the forest. So they escaped into the forest, and they managed to survive the war in the forest. They had some sort of conduit of some local people who were for money, I'm sure, were supplying them with food and um, some clothing that they needed. But basically, they were living uh, as partisans. This is the end of tape two. We will continue the interview with Dr. Ludwig Klein on tape three. Klein on February 23, 1997. Dr. Klein, um, what happened to your family uh, next? Well, as I said, um, my uncle um, went and, and escaped with several young people at the time. Uh, my parents were judged to be too old. They were in their well, my father was in his 40s and my mother was in her 30s. And they were judged to be too old to be able to live, survive in a forest. So they were rejected, so to speak, if they, even if they wanted to go to the, live in the forest. My uncle was about 18 at the time. So he and a number of other young people went and um, uh, lived as partisans uh, in the forest nearby, um, and they had some contact with um, uh, the one or two local Christians who supplied them with um, uh, 
whatever the, they needed, some, some kind of food, maybe some clothing and so forth. And uh, he managed to survive the war. Uh, he, was, uh, he was liberated by the Russians and he joined the Russian army and he fought with the Ru in the Russian army against the Germans. He was wounded during the war, during that fight, and you can see he was wounded through one eye, so he lost one eye during the war. He was, he, one eye was shot out, uh, was shot, and he lost that. Uh, and he um, was living, as I said, in Vienna, and he just came here last month for my mother's funeral. Your, uh, your family, when, how did your family go to Denmark? Okay. Uh, well, as I said, the choice was either to go to a ghetto or to go to this labor camp called Demya, and my parents made the choice to go to Demya. And so uh, my parents... When was that? I'm sorry? When was that? That was uh, 1942, I believe. Sometime in '42, I'm not sure what time of year it was. Uh, sometime around 1942, uh, my parents went, I went, and my grandparents on my mother's side, Schuling Rice and Bertha Rice. All of us went there. The grown-ups went officially. I was hidden because children were not allowed. This was a labor camp. Children could not labor. Okay, children had no, there was no work for children. How and old were you? Well, in 1942, I was nine years old. How did your parents get you into the camp? I don't recall the details of it. I seem to recall that we moved at night. We took a few belongings uh, on a cart. And I, I suspect that I was hidden in that cart somehow or other at night. And they managed to smuggle me into the camp. So officially I wasn't there because officially there were no children there. Where did you stay in the camp? Okay, we stayed in a, um, uh, it was some sort of a, as I recall, some sort of a, um, a house. Um, I, I don't have a better description of it because I really wasn't going in and out of that house. Once I got in there, I stayed there. I wasn't, you know, to get in and out would be almost, I mean, would be very dangerous because then you would expose yourself to the outside. Uh, I was hidden in that house. Again, uh, my father made a kind of a, a camouflaged closet. He, he, there was a, a large, a relatively large closet, and he divided that closet into a real closet, and then there was a camouflaged part that supposedly was hidden, and, you know, if people really looked, I mean, if they looked hard, that, you know, they'd probably find it. The camouflage wasn't that great, but fortunately, nobody looked hard, very hard, to find anybody in that closet. As long as they didn't know I was there, they weren't going to look for me. So they hid you in a closet? They hid me in a closet, correct, and my mother and father went to work, and so did my Grandparents, they were both, my grandparents were relatively young. My grandparents were in their 50s and early 60s. So this was like a, a house that, that held just your family? No, no, no. The, this was a, we had, when I say a house, we had one big room, okay? We lived in that room, okay? Uh, my, my, my parents lived in that room, my, uh, my grandfather, father lived in that, my grandmother lived in that room. And I, and um, I'm not sure whether my uncle lived in that room for a while or, or whether he managed to get escape from that labor camp and into the forest or whether he escaped before we went to Demi, I just don't recall. So Did there were at least five people, or maybe six, in that one room. Did you stay in the closet all 
stay in all night? I stayed in the closet all day when, when my parents were away and working. And when everybody was away, I was all alone. So I stayed in that closet. When my parents came back and, you know, they kind of knew whether somebody was coming in or not, then I could get out of the closet and, and join them, join them. But of course, everybody was on the lookout in case somebody was coming in to, to check on them, or even neighbors, Jews or non-Jews. It didn't make any difference, because don't forget, the Jews themselves who had lost their children would be very jealous that my parents had still a child. So they may, you know, it was possible that they may not have uh, been very discreet about it, uh, one for one reason or another. So that I was hidden from everybody, Germans, Ukrainians, Poles, even Jews. What did your parents tell you? Well, they, they didn't tell me anything specifically. I mean, I knew what was going on, uh, or at least as, as far as a nine-year-old could understand. And again, the consequences of, of what might happen in the future were not, it isn't something that a nine-year-old child thinks about. At least I didn't, and most of the, the people I've spoken to uh, who survived that area, they didn't think in terms of the, the dire consequences that might happen because, ch you know, children, even teenagers, they have no concept of their own mortality, uh, which is a good thing, I think, in many ways. Uh, so it was just a question of surviving, of being very careful, not to make noise, not to be seen by anybody, and surviving from hour to hour, from day to day. Were you able to sit down in this closet? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, not comfortably, but, you know, uh, I was able to sit down on the floor, yes. What, do you remember what was going through your mind when you were in there? Well, the big thing is one was not able to be able to get out, get out on the street, okay. And this, and I remember, um, at night, when I would get out, I could see, uh, because, you know, this was a, we were close to the, to the divide, the border between the, the labor camp and the, the regular village of Demya, so that I could see from when the lights w were turned out and it was um, sort of dark on the outside, but yet I could still see at, at dusk the children playing, you know, so almost across the street. And that, uh, I was extremely jealous that they were able to play on the street and I was not. I mean, that was, it wasn't the, the fact that I might die the next day or be taken to, to guest chamber. That wasn't, that wasn't the issue. The issue was not being able to go out in the street and play with the other kids like the other kids do. I mean, that was a big thing and that still stay, stands out in my mind. But seeing those children at dusk playing and, and I not being able to do that. So that was uh, you know, being cooped up in this, in this little, with this one room, with a closet, and, and not being able to get out. That was, uh, that was, you know, that was the immediate thing, the immediate difference between me and the other, and the Christian children. So that was, uh, that was the thing that stands in my mind right now. I'm not sure what, you know, what I was thinking at the time, but all I can say is what I remember looking back on this. Was there ever any close call to your being discovered there? No, not there, no. How did you eat? My mother would, uh, well, we would get rations, uh, food, mm -hmm. as I recall. My mother would, would leave food for me when she went to work, and then she, we would eat together when they came back from work. What kind of work did your parents do in the labor camp? Well, my father was allowed to become, to continue being a physician uh, in the camp. So who is he treating there? He was treating the Jews there, because as a Jewish physician, he was, by law, he was not allowed to treat Gentiles. Although he did, because there were, n there were no other physicians in the area, so, you know, because they needed him, so he, yeah, I think he did, tr was allowed to treat some Gentiles. Um, I think so. I'm not sure. And he, 
So he was basically, I think, working as a physician. My mother was working on manual labor, and so did my grandparents. There were only Jews in this labor camp? That's right, only Jews. How long were you in Denia? I was in Denia. I'm not. It, we 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 escaped from Denia in 1943. So from 42 to 43, whether it was a year or a little less than a year, I know in 42 we went to Denia, in 43 we escaped from Denia. Can you describe how your family escaped from the labor camp? Okay. Um, my father, being a physician, he was allowed to, to leave the labor camp, to move out of the labor camp. The, the guard would allow him to go out under the pretense that he was going to treat some patients, and he was, since he was the only doctor there, you know, they needed him, so he was allowed to go out. And he, we, he managed somehow or other to spirit us out um, at night. I remember one night he, he managed to, to get my mother and I out of the camp. Um, and we remember this was a, a small village with forests around it and mountains around it. And we managed to somewhere or other get out of the camp. I'm not sure. I don't recall exactly how. Um, but I know my father's ability to move in and out as a physician helped him a great deal because the guard knew that he was going in and out, so they would have kind of sort of waved him off, if you will. And I don't know whether he bribed the guard or what happened, but somewhere or other we managed to spirit uh, my mother and me out of there. How did you don't do you I don't recall how the details. Left? No, I don't recall. I know it was at night because I know we we were going in, going from there, and we we uh, we finally stopped at a, in deep in the forest, because I remember being quite short of, out of breath by the time we, we got where we were supposed to go, at this, uh, this stopping off point, so you to speak. You ran out of the camp? You went on foot? Well, we went on foot, yes, and it was a pretty, I mean, we didn't run because it was too far to run, but, but you know, you had a pretty brisk walk uh, into, into, away from the camp quickly and then into the forest, which abutted the, the camp. Uh, and into the forest, and then fairly deep into the forest, uh, a couple of miles, and uh, at night, and where we finally, you know, could rest. And I remember being quite <laughs> quite out of breath by the time we got there. Um, what happened to your grandparents? My grandparents were supposed to follow us. And then, uh, this, uh, let me just backtrack a little bit. Uh, my father found out that that labor camp was going to be what's called liquidated. In other words, there was, they're going to take all the people from the uh, labor camp, do away with the labor camp, and take all the Jews probably to a concentration camp. And um, he found this out, interestingly enough, there was a there was a civilian head of the camp who was German. And um, his name was Stenzel, S-T-E-N-Z-E-L. He was a civilian. He was not a, um, not a, not a uniformed uh, not, uh, uh, party. Uh, and my father, his wife became ill. And he, he or she called my father to attend to her. My father attended her, and she told him, she says, look, I want you to know on the QT that this labor camp is going to be liquidated on such and such a date. So we sort of owe our lives, in part perhaps, to Mrs. Stencil and presumably Mr. Stencil, for having told my father that the end is near. Although she didn't say it, she obviously she meant it. You better do something. Get out of here. So the fact that my father was a physician and the fact that Mrs. Stencil 
was kind enough to say that, um, we owe our lives to, to, that, to that fact, among others. When my father learned of that, uh, he realized he had, to do, he had to get out. So um, he had, a, he had a, a patient whom he, whose life he saved years ago, who was quite grateful to him, Christian, um, who knew the, the, the area uh, in, in the forest and uh, knew the way towards Hungary, because that was the logical escape place, escape way, is to go to Hungary. Hungary, 1943, was a neutral country. It was not occupied by Germany, one of the few countries in Europe that was not occupied by Germany. And we were very close, about, I think, 20 miles or so from the border with Hungary. So if we could escape undetected to Hungary, we would more or less be safe. So my father contacted this patient, somehow or other, who was quite grateful to my father, and asked him to be our guide. If we were to get out of camp, would he be our guide and then guide us across the border to hu into Hungary? Because he was quite, he was a, quite knowledgeable um, in that, uh, that area. So he agreed, for a price, of course, in addition, he agreed to do this. And he, I think unbeknownst to us at the time, uh, contacted one of his friends to, he would take us part of the way, and his friend would take us the rest of the way. So when my father learned of the fact that that camp was going to be liquidated, he managed to get together with another family who had also had a child in camp, Mr. and Mrs. Tersh, whose son is here, um, who came to my mother's funeral. Um, and this, this, he was also hidden, of course, uh, in another part of camp. And we managed to escape, the two families managed to escape into the forest, being met by this guide, my father's patient. The plan was for us to make sure that we were kind of safe. And once we were safe, my father would write a little note to my, my grandparents, who were still in camp, in Hebrew, saying, everything is OK. You can trust this man. Go with this man. Why my grandparents didn't go at the same time, I don't know. I, I, that's a little murky, and I'm not sure why. But the plan was, I remember my father writing in Hebrew a little note saying, we're OK. This was about halfway through. We're OK. You can trust him. Because many times, people with a Jews would arrange with someone to take them and guide them out. And that someone would kill the Jews because they knew that they had money one, on them, or at least they suspected they had money on them. After all, these people didn't w become guides just for the, for the altruistic motives. They were there to, for money. Uh, so the theory, the, the theory was for this uh, guide, uh, why should he risk going against German law? After all, it was against the law to hide Jews. Why not kill these Jews, not expose himself to German law, and get the money anyway? Not just get part of the money, but get the whole, all of it. So there were many, many instances where somebody would arrange for a guide to try and get them out through into Hungary, and they would be killed by the guide. Or the guide would call in the Germans, and the Germans would arrest them, and they would divide the money or something. Usually, the, the guides would kill them, because then they would get all the money. They didn't want to share the money with anybody else. Did your grandparents get the note? I don't know. So what happened to them? They were, I assume, uh, sent to a concentration camp when the, when, the camp when the labor camp was liquidated, and they perished in a concentration camp. I did make some inquiries. Uh, as you know, the Red Cross 
especially since the the fall of the Berlin Wall, the the, the Russians have some uh, a lot of uh, data from the uh, German concentration camp records, and many of the names have s of the Jews who perished in various concentration camps surfaced because the Russians glued up the records. Uh, and the Red Cross is in charge of them. I asked them to um, search the records, and they were not able to find my grandparents in any of the uh, any of the camps that that the records are available. So, but I I'm quite certain that they were that uh, Demnia as a labor camp was liquidated. They were taken with um, with the remaining Jews into a concentration camp, and they um, perished in the concentration camp. Your family, your father, your mother, yourself, you, you, you were, got safely into Hungary. We and what happened then? You were, you got false papers. Wh and okay. where were you living there after you Okay. Escaped? We, um, my father's patient, halfway through, still in Poland, handed us over to another guide whom we did not know. We were rather apprehensive that, you know, this fellow whom we didn't know, what was he going to do with us, and so forth. And he was a little, um, what you would call today, a little flaky. So <laughs> that made it a little worse. And um, uh, and remember, you know, the history of, of these so-called guided tours, you know, ending in disaster was always in front of us. So. Um, we were a little suspicious of him, and he, he, he said, well, you know, I, I'm supposed to be the guide, but I really don't know where, which, way, which way to go, and I'm not sure. And, and he was sort of hemming and hawing, and, and you know, the, uh, my mother, who was quite perceptive, uh, uh, didn't like the whole thing. And, and we, had, we had very little, we had uh, some clothing, extra set of clothing with us, and uh, and a blanket or two, and that's all. That's all we carried with a knapsack and, and I think one little valise or something like that. And the Tertius had pretty much the same thing. And um, um, and he was sort of eyeing those, that baggage, and he thought that, you know, who knows what, how many, how much money is in there and so forth, and jewelry. And so my mother wanted some or other to tell him that there really isn't any jewelry there and there's no money there. So he better get that idea out of his head. So one, one day um, in the morning, she decided, she said she's going to pack, repack this thing because it wasn't, the clothing wasn't packed correctly and, and so forth. So she, she opened up all the valises and all the knapsacks and, and took everything out so that he could see what was in there, which was basically old clothes and a couple of blankets. And Mr. Tersh happened to have a gun with him. So she, she spread everything out on this, on this, in this uh, clearing in the forest so he could see. And then on top of that, she put the gun down. As soon as he saw this, remember, this is a very simple Ukrainian peasant who was a little flaky to begin with. So and it, it seems that my mother read his mind quite correctly. As soon as he saw this, he, he crossed himself several times. And, and we had no trouble with him since then. He guided us exactly where we want to go. He, he took us across the, across the border of, of, um, uh, of Hungary. And um, about five or 10 miles into the Hungarian border, we managed to make contact with a Jewish family, small village Hungarian Jewish family, who took us in uh, over, I think, one night, uh, washed our clothing so we, my father could shave and, you know, and, and wash and, and press the clothing so we wouldn't look like we were, you know, literally came out of the woods. Uh, and um, camouflaged us a little bit. Uh, by that I mean uh, uh, she gave us Hungarian type clothing, you know, uh, Hungarian looking clothing, not Polish looking clothing, so, so she, we wouldn't stand out. 
Uh, she managed to give my father a bandage, a white bandage around his face. Uh, in those days, if you had a toothache, you would bandage the whole face, and you would put cotton over here where it hurt, and you would walk around like that. And of course, you couldn't talk, right? And they managed to buy us train tickets and put us on the train into Budapest. So my mother was dressed as a, as a Hungarian peasant woman. My father was dressed as a Hungarian peasant with this white bandage on it. In case somebody spoke to him, since they neither of them spoke Hungarian, he could just point mm, because, you know, he couldn't talk. And the law in, at the time in Hungary was such that if the Hungarians found a Polish Jew within a 50-kilometer radius, with a 50 kilometer from their border with Poland, they would have to, they were, they agreed to send the Jews back to Poland, to Germany. So we, we were only safe as soon as we passed that 50 kilometer marker. I remember uh, we knew what town it was supposed to be, so once we passed that town, we looked at each other and we were safe. And that train took us into Budapest. And that was in 1943. Uh, as I said, uh, Hungary, Budapest was, was a neutral country. Uh, there were no, no, it wasn't occupied by Germany. And um, uh, there were a number of Polish refugees there, both Jews and non-Jews. Um, and at that time, um, of course, my parents were always afraid that, that Hungary might become, might get invaded uh, by the Germans and the same thing would happen in Hungary. So at that time, we got false, we had false papers, changed name, and of course, with religion, we were now Catholic. What was your name? The name that we went under at that time was Malek, M-A-L-E-K which is a sort of a translation of Klein, which means small, sort of a corrupted translation. But Malek is a fairly common name in Polish. So that's where my father came across, came with that, with that name. Um, so we were living as Polish Catholics in Hungary under an assumed name. And where were you living? Well, we were living uh, in Budapest. In a house there? We moved, we subled, we usually subletted a room uh, from a family because uh, that was the least expensive way to go. And um, that's where we lived in various, with various families. This is the end of take three. We will continue the interview with Dr. Ludwig Klein on take four. Dr. Ludwig Klein, February 23rd, 1977. 1997. Um, Dr. Klein, uh, you were telling us how your family um, made your way deeper to, to Budapest. You camouflaged. Right. Your father was able to get false papers. Yes. And you changed your name and you were living in, in a house. We were living, we were subletting a, a room in, in one or two or three, fam three houses and various families, with various families. I don't remember how many, but that was the way where one lived. Is, uh, uh, and we lived in Budapest until, uh, well, we lived in Budapest for a, for a relatively short time, and then um, we were uh, we went to live in a small town. It was a summer resort on Lake Balaton, B A L 
A T O N. And uh, the name of the small town or village um, was called Balaton Sarso. And we lived there. Uh, we again subletted an apartment, uh, a, 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 uh, a room with um, uh, use of a kitchen. And I, when I was in a Polish boarding school um, about eight or ten miles away, um, four Poles, uh, but uh, Christian Poles, but there were a few, and I think I was the only Jew in that um, boarding school. There so may you have been lived, another you one. lived at the school? As a boarding school, I lived there, but on, as I recall, on weekends, I would take the train, and it's only two, two stops on the train, back to Balaton Sarso. The name of the town where I was, uh, where the, the uh, boarding school was, was called Balaton Boglar, B-O-G-L-A-R. Now, your, your classmates thought you were Christian. My classmates thought I was Christian, uh, my my uh, religion religion teacher, who was a priest, uh, didn't quite believe that. Uh, he probably knew what was going on, um, and I found this later on because when I when I finished school, um, he I got a you know a, a report card with. Uh, various subjects in a grade, subject in grade, math, B or, you know, Polish A or whatever. And, and of course, in one of the subjects was religion. And remember, religion was taught and officially in, in Polish schools. There was no separation of church and state. And he would not give me a grade for the religion. It was left blank. So, um, uh, you know, we found out that he didn't quite believe that I was Catholic, even though I went to church and I prayed and I tried to participate in during the, the teaching of, of religion. Um, I guess he must have realized that I didn't know too much. So um, uh, anyway, um, I lived there. Were you afraid of being um, discovered? Uh, yes, of course, of course. Right. Did anything ever happen, like a close call? Uh, no, don't forget, uh, at that time, the Germans one did not occupy Hungary. So this was a sort of precautionary, if you will. Uh, I mean, it wasn't pleasant to be a Jew there, especially a Jew, a Polish Jew, a refugee. Uh, the Hungarian Jews really were not touched yet. Uh, but, uh, you know, if you say you one thing and somebody doesn't believe you, it's not pleasant. Um, but nothing happened. There wasn't any close call because the Germans weren't there yet. So did your father continue to work as a doctor? He, um, he really had no practice there. I mean, he, he treated a few Polish refugees there, you know, more or less gratis because, you know, there wasn't uh, uh, much that he, there wasn't any work for him there. Uh, and uh, he didn't have a Hungarian license to begin with, so uh, technically he couldn't treat anybody as a doctor. Um, so he was basically unemployed. You mentioned that you, your family passed as Polish nobility? Well, that was later on. That was when, um, when the Germans invaded Hungary. And that was when? Well, the Germans invaded Hungary in 1944. So approximately a year after we came to Hungary, the Germans sort of followed us, if you will. And once that happened, it was 1944, of course, they brought in with them all the, the, the Nuremberg laws against Jews, and uh, they were going to catch them and catch all the Jews and, and transport them to concentration camps and, and that whole story with Eichmann and, and Raoul Wallenberg and so forth. Uh, so once that happened, when they occupied Hungary, 
uh, we could no longer, we did no longer felt safe, even with false pass, false papers saying that we were not, we were Catholic and not Jews. Those false papers, uh, I mean, the quality of those papers was not terrific. And in addition, don't forget, my my father was known in the Polish expatriate community in uh, in Hungary. There were people there who knew my father from Poland, so you couldn't say, "Well, I'm now, you know, Doctor uh, Malek," whereas before I, they knew him as Doctor Klein. I mean, it just didn't work. Of course, that was so. Even we had those papers. There were people who knew my father from Poland, and it was not possible to. It would be very risky for us to be stay on the surface, even no. with the. What did your family do? Well, um, what what was this decided, and it really wasn't. We we wanted to go into hiding. And the 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 family that we were renting, subletting the the room from. Uh, the the man was a converted was a Jew who converted to Catholicism, and he was married to a Catholic. Catholic woman. So my father told him, look, the Germans are here. Even though you converted to Christianity, converted to Catholicism, you were born a Jew, and in German eyes, you are a Jew, regardless of how many times you cross yourself or how many times you say Hail Mary or how many times you go to church, you are a Jew, and therefore you will be persecuted. And therefore, it behooves you to hide, and we should hide together. You have an excellent opportunity here because your wife is not Jewish. She is Christian. She's Catholic. And in German eyes, she's a Catholic, even though she's married to you. Therefore, if you could find a hiding place for yourself and for us, your wife would be the conduit. She would be living all in the open. As a Catholic, she could say she divorced you, or you ran away, or she doesn't know where you are. And your wife would supply us with food and, and whatever we needed in this hiding place until the war was over. So he bought this idea. And again, the cellar. The cellar was divided. And it was one part of it was camouflaged. The entrance was camouflaged. So that you could go in there, and you know, if somebody looked around, you didn't wouldn't see that there was another part of the cellar. And the th the theory was to for for this man, his name was Galhidi, Mr. Galhidi, G A L H I D I, Mr. Galhidi. He would be there with us. His wife would be perfect, the perfect conduit to the surface, and she would give us food and so forth, and that, would, well, that was the plan. Well, it was all ready, it was all set. We were about to go in there, and one day um, Mr. Galhidi comes to my father and he says, um, I, want, I did a wonderful thing today. So my father said, what, so, what did you do that was so wonderful today? Mr. Galhidi says, I have a very good friend who is the chief of police in town. And guess what I did today? I told this chief of police about our hiding place. Okay. So that was the end of the hiding place. Okay. So now my father had to come up with another scheme to go underground. And my father, some or other, I don't know how, got in contact with a, with a Hungarian Jew by the name of Cohen, who lived in another nearby village. And he told Mr. Cohen what was going on in Poland. And he told Mr. Cohen, you know, the same thing is going to happen in, in Hungary. Do you have any suggestions as to how we can hide? 
So Mr. Cohen said, look, you know, maybe this is happening in Poland, but this is not going to happen in Hungary because we're really not Jews, we're Hungarians and, 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 and General and Admiral Horty, who was the who was the uh, president of Hungary at the time. He was not the president, he was the regent in, in, in place of a king, because Hungary was a monarchy at the time. Horty, who was a quarter Jewish anyway, would not, so the rumor went, would not allow anything to happen to the Jews. So my father said, look, never mind about Horty and, and, and so forth, but I need a hiding place. What do you suggest? Mr. Cohen was a very smart man. He said, I would suggest the following. I know a very poor peasant family a couple of miles up the road. And they have a, you know, they live out in the sticks away from everybody and they don't get along with the town people very well because they're a little eccentric. Uh, but, they, and they need money. They're very poor. They will hide you for money. I mean, you pay them and they'll hide you. And I'll talk to them. And sure enough, he talked to them and they agreed that for a certain amount of money once a month, they would hide us. And um, however, Mr. Cohen says, they're anti-Semitic. So you mustn't tell them that they're Jews. Okay? So you have to give them some sort of a story as to why non-Jews are hiding from the Germans, from the Nazis. So what could you say? It was well known at the time that the Germans were after the leadership of the Poles. Anybody who could conceivably be in a leadership position was generally very often arrested. They weren't killed, but they were arrested just to make sure that there was no leadership to make trouble for the Germans. So they were arresting prominent uh, politicians whom they could find, uh, prominent aristocracy. Now remember the Poles were, were very fond of aristocrats and they looked up to them and so forth. So um, the Mr. Cohen said, look, you are Polish aristocrats from now on. My father managed to get another set of false papers saying that he is now a baron. Baron, and I don't, can't remember the name, but it was a name, a very good Polish name of aristocrats ending with an SKI, something like Dombrowski. And <clears throat> at the time, my father, uh, there were three men, uh, Mr. Tersh, a dentist who was a bachelor, and Mr. and Mrs. Tersh and their son and my parents and I, and there was another young lady and another man. So there were about eight, let's see, three and six, seven, eight, there were eight of us. So there were three men. The three men said that they were brothers, and they were, all three of them were, were barons. Okay, Baron Dobrovsky. My father was the oldest brother, Mr. Tersh was the, the youngest brother, and the dentist was the middle brother. And the reason they were running from the Germans is because they were landed gentry, positions of leadership, very well known, very rich, huge amounts of real estate owned in Poland, and if the Germans found them, you know, they would, would arrest them and so forth. So the, the eight of you hid in this. In the this eight cottage. of us hid in a little cottage on the property of this, of this uh, Hungarian poor peasant, whose last name I don't recall, but his wife's name was Monsi. His first name, her first name was Monsi because she would be the one who would visit us quite often. And again, we were Christian. We were Catholic, of course. And any time, every time she came, she usually visited us at night because she didn't want anybody to see her going into this little cottage, which was usually uh, wasn't uh, used at all. And I would kneel down and cross myself and, and say my night prayers, so just to a nice show for her to show her how religious I was, and so forth. Because the she was very very religious, and that was a bond that 
I could show, you know, how religious I was in the whole family. Uh, we all wore crosses and so forth. So um, we lived there, and that one cottage, basically a one-room cottage, with, uh, and uh, with a um, 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 there was no floor; it was dirt floor. And every Friday, you you washed the dirt floor. And you couldn't walk on it because it was wet; it was mud. So you had to wait till it dried, and then you could walk on it. So we were <coughs> we were there for a couple of months, and one day um, somebody happened to come on the property and happened to knock on the door, and even though the curtains were drawn and the door was locked, somewhere or other we felt that they knew that there was somebody in there, and I think they heard us talk or something like that because we didn't realize that somebody was coming. So. Things got a little suspicious in town. There were some rumors that, that maybe this, this peasant was hiding somebody in there. So we decided to get out of that cottage and let that cottage sort of air out, if you will, so that she could show people there's really nobody in the cottage, nobody's living there, and, and you know, whatever, whoever was there, maybe it was some, you know, some vagabond or a thief who was hiding there with the night, but anyway, there was no one there. So we left and we went to Budapest. Uh, and at that time, things got a little worse in Budapest because while in the beginning, hung, the Hungarian government was sort of cooperating with the Germans, uh, by that time, the war was going on and on and on and was about to end, and the Hungarian government realized that you know, they were on the wrong side of the fence, so to speak, and they wanted to declare themselves completely neutral, as I recall, but, and, uh, and uh, uh, so the Germans wouldn't have any of it. So, then the, so at that time, the Germans surrounded parliament uh, with with some with guns and I remember machine guns. Uh, they were lying there, machine guns and a few s you small saw cannons. This? Yes, small cannons, and they there were there was no shooting going on, but they were they laid siege to to the Hungarian Parliament, so as a show sort of as a show of force to tell this Hungarian Parliament, don't you declare neutrality? You stay on our side or else. So we were there for a couple of days. Where were you staying in Budapest? Uh, I don't recall where we stayed. We might have, again, sublet a room from a family. This was the usual practice. And when we saw that things were getting very, very hot in Budapest, and, and there was some, a couple of days elapsed so that that cottage could be aired out, so to speak, we went back to, Buda to, to that little cottage which was a couple of miles away from Balaton. Sarso, I don't recall the name of that town. And we stayed there until we were liberated by the Russian army. Remember the day? I don't remember the day, but it was because it was a lot of back and forth. Uh, the, the front moved back and forth. But it was, in, it was in February of 1945, February of 1945. And I remember uh, there were reports that the Russian army was, we didn't see any Russian soldiers, but there were reports the Russian army had already overrun uh, our position, so to speak, and the Germans were withdrawing. And I even, we even saw one Russian soldier. So at that time, I wanted I said to my father, hey, why don't we come out and say, you know, we're, we're, you're wonderful, you liberated us, we're Jews, blah, blah, blah. My father said, wait a minute. Keep cool. Relax. This may not be the end of it. And sure enough, the Germans counterattacked, overran our position again, so we were in German territory again. They pushed the Russians back. Had we done what I suggested, we probably wouldn't be alive today. So then, as the German counterattacked, they, they moved the Russians back a number of miles. 
And of course, the, German, the, the Russians counterattacked again and pushed the Russians back. So that was around February. Once the Russians, we found ourselves again in Russian territory, we left that little cottage and went further back towards the Russian, towards Russia, so that we wouldn't be overrun again. You see, so we went back, and uh, that was all in February and. Uh, March, and we settled in Seged, in S-Z-E-G-E-D, in probably sometime in March, in, in Seged. And the when, I, when the war was over, in the beginning of May of 1945, we, I was in Seged, and my father was in Budapest at the time. And then your family went to a DP camp? Well, from Seged, um, my father couldn't practice medicine in Hungary, so he was, uh, he was uh, buying and selling, uh, um, I guess, over uh, you know, various blankets and equipment that was no longer, was manufactured for the war, but was no longer usable. Uh, war surplus, basically, that's what he was. So he was trying to make a living selling and buying some war surplus. And in addition, uh, when the, the Russian army was coming into various countries, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Poland, and so forth, they printed their own money. They printed, you know, Czech, whatever the, 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 the currency was. So there was a market to be made exchanging the Czech currency for the Hungarian currency. And so that a, a Russian soldier who was coming from Czechoslovakia with his Czech money couldn't use the Czech money in Hungary, so he wanted Hungarian money. And I would be, I was um, 45, was, I was 12 years old, I would buy the the Czech money from the Russian soldier. I would go up to a Russian soldier because I spoke a little Russian. Remember, the Russian, Russians lived in our house for two years, so we, I learned how to speak Russian a little bit, and that came in handy. So I'd come up to these Russian soldiers who looked like they were coming from someplace else, and I said, do you have any money to sell? And if you do, I'll give you some Hungarian money, and you give me, I'll, I'll give you some Hungarian money, you give me the Czech money or whatever other money you have. So, and I was able, and then I would give this money to my father. I would take a trip to, to Budapest from Seged, give, deliver this money to my father, who was able to obtain a better exchange rate in Budapest than I could in, in, in Seged, you see. So that's the way that went. And then we left Seged in 19, latter part of 1945, settled in Budapest, and there was a Jewish, um, boarding school uh, in a suburb of Budapest, where I spent from 45 to 46, one year. Um, it was a potpourri of various subjects. Since I had lost, you know, a number of years of schooling, uh, my father taught me a you know, a little bit during those days. Uh, he taught me some math, he taught me a little bit of Latin, some history, uh, Polish. Um, uh, I had a lot of catching up to do. So, and so did other students at that time. So I was at that boarding school for about a year, from 45 to 46. And after, in 46, we decided to go to Vienna. Uh, Vienna was sort of a, um, a known quantity because my father graduated from the University of Vienna Medical School. My father spoke German flawlessly. So that was a known quantity. My parents did not want to go back to Poland, which was Russia by then, you see. So it meant if we, went to, if we were to go back to Lviv or Skolet, we would be now going back to Poland, to so Russia. So you never went back to your hometown? Never went back to the hometown, correct. And we arrived in Vienna, 1946, and we stayed there until we departed 
in a in a DP camp, in a displaced persons camp. What was the name of the camp? Well, it was in Vienna. It was on um, Artsgasse Two, number two, in Hernals. Hernals is a, the sixteenth Bezirk, or what? The, if you were in Paris, you would call it arrondissement. Uh, the sixteenth part of uh, of uh, Vienna. And we stayed there from 46 to 51. And when did you come to the United States? 1951, April of in 51. And where did your family settle? Well, at first we settled, uh, the first residence was um, uh, down on Lafayette Street, where the, um, the theater is. Um, what's the name of that theater in Lafayette Street? Um, uh, Pap Theater, Joseph Pap Public Theater, that at that time housed uh, refugees, uh, mostly Jewish refugees, and it was supported by uh, Hias, the Hebrew Immigration so uh, Society. So we lived there for a couple of weeks, then we we lived in a little hotel, uh, hotel um, on in the 30s, in the 30 or 29th Street or something like that, near Lexington Avenue. There, in a small hotel in a room, and then we moved. We again sublet a room uh, with kitchen privileges in Borough Park in Brooklyn. We lived there for a couple of months, and then we moved, we got in a, a rental apartment. This is the end of the fourth tape. We will continue the interview with Dr. Ludwig Klein on tape five.